Hello everyone. When I defended my PhD thesis in October 2022, it was streamed online, but I didn't think to record the meeting. Since I would still like to have the presentation available online, I finally gathered the energy to go through the text again at home in front of a microphone. It won't be exactly the same experience, and the stress level is a bit lower today, but here it is. Hello, thank you all for coming to this presentation and to hear me talk about what I've been doing in these past seven years. Before we really get into the topic of the thesis and this long title, I would like to give a bit of context. So let's start with the last words, digital pathology. Pathology is the study of diseases. Let's take an example. After a mammogram or a prostate exam, someone has a suspected tumor. To determine the severity of the tumor and what to do about it, one very common step is to take a tissue sample, for instance, with a biopsy. This tissue sample, after some fairly complicated processing, ends up as tissue slides, which can be viewed under a microscope. Digital pathology just means that instead of looking through a microscope, the image is scanned at a very high resolution so that a digital copy can be viewed on a computer, stored in hospital archives, or potentially transmitted to other pathologists if a second opinion is needed. These images are typically huge. From this relatively low magnification view, we can zoom in all the way to the level of the cell nuclei. What are pathologists looking for in those images? Well, there are lots of indicators that are used to grade tumors, but some common ones are based on the shape of some cellular structures, like here with the Gleason grading scale based on the shape of glands in the prostate, and others are based on counting some particular objects, like lymphocytes or, in this case, mitotic cells. The problems are so complex that the criteria used by the pathologist are often very difficult to assess objectively, and there can be a lot of disagreement between the opinions of the pathologist. Some of the tasks, like counting the mitosis, can also be very time-consuming and repetitive. So it would be very nice to have some automated image analysis methods to help. In the past decade, the most successful image analysis methods have been deep learning algorithms. So let me briefly explain what these are about. Let's say that we have as input an image. To make things simple, we will say it has only three pixels. And let's call the, their values x, y, and z. At the output, we have two classes, C1, C2. Between the two, we have a model. A model is a mathematical mapping between our inputs and our outputs. One of the simplest models we can have is a linear model. We could, for instance, have output is C1 if Ax plus By plus Cz plus D is above zero, and C2 otherwise. In this case, A, B, C, D are the parameters of the model. And training the model means finding the best values for these parameters so that the output is as correct as possible. In supervised machine learning, finding the best parameters is done by using a training dataset containing examples where the expected output is known. Obviously, that model is a bit too simple. So what we can do is make it bigger and more complex. Neural networks do that. They combine relatively simple equations, chained together, to produce a model that is more complex and has more parameters. The network is organized in layers built on top of each other. The first layers, closer to the inputs, learn to recognize small-scale patterns and colors. Then the following layers combine those patterns into more abstract concepts, shapes, object parts, and in the end, these high-level abstract features are combined to produce the desired outputs. They will obviously also take larger images as inputs. In the 90s, the best network for image analysis had more than 50,000 parameters. At the time, it was very difficult to train anything bigger than that, and the performances were relatively limited. In the 2000s and 2010s, however, 
there was a big shift in image analysis. As it became much cheaper to store and transmit data, larger datasets became available. And with the rapid development of GPUs, the amount of processing power available to train the networks increased dramatically. Modern deep networks have millions or tens of millions of parameters and can model very complex functions. But to do that, they also need a lot of data. And ideally, a lot of annotated data, meaning that the expected output is known for every example given to the network. So how do we get annotations? If we are trying to create something like a self-driving car, we can use something like this, CAPTCHAs. If you've been on the internet in the past decade, you've probably encountered one of those. They don't just check if you're a robot or a human. The input you provide is used to train and refine deep learning models. By crowdsourcing the annotation of the data, it's easier to get larger datasets. But in digital pathology, you can't do that. If you ask thousands of random internet users to select all the mitotic cells in an image, you will not get very useful annotations. In digital pathology, the annotations are complex and they require trained experts. There will always be a trade-off between the number of annotations you can get and the quality of these annotations. There is also a certain amount of subjectivity and disagreement between experts as the criteria used by pathologists can be very difficult to evaluate. So that brings us back to the title of the thesis. What is the impact of the reality of the annotations we can get in digital pathology on the training of deep learning algorithms and also on their evaluation? There are three big topics that I want to cover in the rest of this presentation. And for each, I will show some examples of our experiments and explain the conclusions that we were able to reach. The first is the study of imperfect annotations and their effects on the learning process. The second is the analysis of evaluation processes and metrics and how imperfect annotations and inter-expert disagreements can be taken into account better. Finally, I will talk about our review of digital pathology competitions how they take or don't take these questions into account, and how they can be improved in the future. Let's start with imperfect annotations. This is an image from the MONUSEC 2018 nuclei segmentation competition. So the goal is to find the nuclei, which are contoured here in yellow. This image is part of the test set meaning it's used to compare the results of competing algorithms to the expected outputs. In this image, however, there seem to be some objects which are probably nuclei as well, but are not annotated. This is a very common type of imperfection. Digital pathology often deals with very large images and we can have very small and numerous objects of interest. It's therefore very common to have incomplete annotations where only some of the images, or some regions of the images, are annotated. But there are other types of imperfections as well. The shape of the objects can be fairly complex. For segmentation problems, making pixel-precise annotations is extremely time-consuming. So it's common to have imprecise annotations, where there is an uncertainty on the exact boundaries. Finally, when humans have to do a very repetitive task, like annotating thousands of nuclei in an image, there will always be some plain mistakes. Incorrect annotations means that there is an uncertainty on the labels, even in the annotated regions. We studied the effect of imperfect annotations, as well as some learning strategies that can be used to counteract those effects. To do that, we started with some very good clean datasets such as this one from a colorectal cancer gland segmentation challenge. The original annotations are as close to pixel perfect as we can get in a digital pathology dataset. So what we did was to artificially add imperfections. We simulated different types. For missing annotations, we randomly removed annotated objects from the datasets. We randomly deformed the shape of the objects by making them smaller or larger and we simplify the contours, simulating a quicker annotation method where, 
instead of precisely going around the contour, the expert would just have selected a few points to give us a polygonal approximation. We trained three different deep learning models on corrupted datasets with different levels of corruption. Our results show that there is a certain natural robustness to some imperfections, and in particular, the models are very robust to contour simplification, even when only four or five points remain in the contour. Removing too many objects, however, lead to a strong performance drop. This indicates that when annotating datasets for deep learning models, the best strategy for the expert pathologist could be to provide a rough set of simplified annotations while making sure that few objects are missed. What kind of learning strategies can we use? Well, as we found, the main problem we have is the missing annotations. So in this type of datasets, we make the assumption that the regions where we have annotations are generally more reliable than the regions with empty annotations. In other words, it's more likely for an expert pathologist to miss an object than to randomly annotate something where there is nothing. One easy thing that we could do is therefore to only use the more reliable part of the dataset and to discard the rest. It's easy, but it also means that we don't use all of the data. And as we've said before, deep learning algorithms need to be fed as much data as possible to work well. It also inevitably leads to a biased model, which will tend to predict objects everywhere. The method that worked best, according to our experiments, tried to solve this issue and to use the whole data despite the uncertainty. The way we did this was to first train a biased model, as with the only positive approach. Then we used this model to generate annotations on the regions with no annotations. The final model is trained using all the data, but for the regions with no annotations, we randomly switch between using the original empty annotations and the generated ones. This allows us to use all the data while recognizing the uncertainty of the annotations. We also noted, however, that these results were highly dependent on the characteristics of the dataset, and also on the metric we used to evaluate the results. And this leads us to our next topic, how to evaluate an algorithm? And it may seem like a fairly easy question. We see how many times they are right, how many times they are wrong, and that's it. But I want to quickly show why that's not always the case. Let's take a task that has nothing to do with digital pathology. Let's say that we are comparing two algorithms on their ability to classify images between cats and dogs. We test the first algorithm on our evaluation sets and find that it has an accuracy of two-thirds, around 67%. It's not a very good algorithm, but it seems to have learned something about the data. The second algorithm, meanwhile, is really bad. It always predicts dog. In our evaluation sets, it leads to an accuracy of 50%. In this case, the algorithms are well ranked. The first algorithm, while not very good, is certainly more useful than the second. But what if we change our evaluation datasets a little bit? There is, after all, nothing that guarantees that a dataset will have exactly as many examples of each class. In real-world scenarios, in fact, that's very unlikely. We compare our algorithms again, and we still have the same score for the first one. But for the second, now we get an accuracy of 83%. If we use the accuracy as a metric on this test set, we have to conclude that algorithm 2 is better than algorithm 1, even though it's functionally useless. This kind of situation happens all the time in medical datasets, where, for instance, more invasive tumors tend to be less represented in the data than benign tumors. An algorithm that never recognizes an invasive tumor, however, would not be very useful, even though it may have a better accuracy than a model that doesn't always give such an optimistic prediction. So, what can we do? Well, fortunately, there are many evaluation metrics available to us. These metrics are generally related to the definition of the image analysis task. 
In our work, we survey digital pathology competitions and publications, and we categorize the most common image analysis tasks using three different basic tasks. Classification, what is this thing? Detection, find all instances of things. And segmentation, find which pixels are things or not things. In each of these basic tasks, there are many different commonly used metrics. More complex tasks can generally be defined as combinations of the three basic ones, and similarly, more complex metrics tend to take the form of combinations of these basic metrics. In the thesis, we studied the relationship between the different metrics, which ones tend to behave in the same way and which ones can sometimes give very different results. We also studied their behavior depending on the characteristics of the data, such as the class imbalance that we showed in our cat and dog example, and how to better include the uncertainty and the differences of opinions between experts. From this, we try to provide some guidelines on the selection and interpretation of those metrics. And I want to show just a few examples of the analysis that we made. The first example concerns the use of a segmentation metric called the intersection over union. This is one of the most commonly used metrics for this task, and it's a relatively intuitive metric. Let's say that we have an image with an expert annotation so that we know which pixels belong to the object. Now we want to evaluate a prediction from an algorithm. How do we do that? Well, first we take the intersection between the two objects and we compute the area. Then we take the union of the two objects and we also compute the area. Finally, to get the intersection over union, we divide the intersection by the union. Not very surprising. This gives us a very straightforward measure of the overlap between the two objects. The IOU, intersection over union, will be equal to 1 if the objects are perfectly overlapping and equal to 0 if they are completely separate. So what can go wrong? Well, let's look at these five examples from the Manusac 2020 challenge, with the expert annotations in solid blue and predictions from the algorithm of one of the teams that participated in the challenge in dashed black. According to the IOU, these five images all show very similar segmentation performances. In all five cases, this performance is also relatively bad. An IOU under 0.5 is often interpreted as meaning that the object wasn't actually detected by the algorithm. Visually, however, it's clear that it's not the case here. The first image in particular shows a segmentation that's actually very good. The shape of the object is correct, and the predicted and annotated boundaries are both in the same fuzzy region that surrounds the nucleus. The other segmentations are clearly not as good, despite their similar IOU. The problem here is that the IOU is bad for small objects with uncertain boundaries. The central region of the nuclei where the annotation is more certain, has a very small area, which means that any error on the border region will have a much larger impact. Some alternatives are to use a slightly modified version of the metric, which doesn't penalize errors that are only a few pixels away from the annotated border. Another possibility is to use a metric such as Osdorf's distance, which measures the distance between the contours and, in this case, gives us more information on whether the correct shape was found. In general, however, different metrics will have their pros and cons and provide different information. So it's always advisable to compute several different metrics to get richer insights on the performances of the algorithms. Let's now look at another example. What we have here is an image from the Gleason 2019 challenge with the annotations made by four different expert pathologists. The task is to find Gleason patterns, which are indicative of how invasive the tumor is. The colors here show different grades. We can immediately see that, for this particular image, the opinions of the experts vary a lot, with one of them showing everything as benign, in blue, and others finding patterns of different grades. So, how do we evaluate algorithms when experts disagree? A common strategy is to use a consensus annotation. 
This can either be done by putting all the experts in the same room and ask them to find an agreement, or, as was done in this particular challenge, by using an automated method to merge the different annotations together. Then the results of different algorithms can be compared to the consensus. The, the main problem with this approach is that the consensus no longer contains the information about the uncertainty of the annotations. So there is no difference between images where all experts were in agreement and images like this one where they disagreed a lot. What we propose in our work is to keep the individual expert annotations and to compare them with each other and with the consensus. In this way, we can look at the similarity between experts as a form of distance. So for instance here, expert 1 and 2 share many similarities in their annotation, so they should be relatively close together. Expert 3 has some parts in common but is clearly further away, and expert 4 is even further away with their all B9 annotation. The consensus would fall somewhere in the middle. We applied this ID to the entire Gleason 2019 dataset to create a visualization of the expert disagreement using a method called multidimensional scaling or MDS. There are six experts in total shown here with the labels 1 to 6, and we computed three different consensus methods which appear here in the middle. The first interesting thing in this approach is that we can see how the experts relate to each other and identify those, like expert 1 here, that are often in disagreement with the others. But this can also provide some interesting insights on the performances of algorithms. If instead of computing a metric on the consensus, we compute it on all experts and all consensus methods, we can then see where the algorithm would appear on this visualization. This can allow us, for instance, to differentiate between an algorithm that's close to the consensus and very similar to some of the experts, from an algorithm that may be just as close to the consensus, but with disagreements that are very unlike any of the experts. Similarly, we could differentiate between algorithms that are further away from the consensus, but still within the range of inter-expert variability, from algorithms that are away from the consensus and from all experts. This idea of maximizing the insights we can get on the algorithms is something that we came back to a lot in our work. It also applies to the evaluation of complex tasks, such as this one from the Monusac challenge. Here we need at the same time to detect the individual nuclei objects, to segment them at the pixel level, and to classify these nuclei in four different categories. The metric used in the challenge was the panoptic quality. And the panoptic quality combines two of the basic metrics, the detection F1 score and the average segmentation IOU of the detected nuclei, and combines them by multiplying them together. One of the problems here is that the interpretation of range of values for these two metrics is very different. An F1 score of 0.5 could correspond to an algorithm that misses a very large portion of the nuclei, making it completely useless in practice. An IOU of 0.5, meanwhile, can correspond to a segmentation that's relatively good for small nuclei. It is therefore very weird to say that an algorithm with an F1 score of 0.5 and an average IOU of 1 has the same performance as an algorithm with an F1 score of 1 and an average IOU of 0.5. Mixing independent metrics, in this case, can clearly lead to incorrect rankings in complex tasks. So this is what we recommend based on our analysis of evaluation metrics. Use simple independent metrics, don't try to combine them into something that becomes impossible to interpret. If multiple experts are available, and ideally they should be, compare algorithms to all of them rather than trying to find a single ground truth which probably doesn't exist anyway. And finally, there will be uncertainty, uncertainties on the value of the metric. So we shouldn't pretend, pretend that they are absolutely right. If two algorithms are within the uncertainty in the annotations, then we cannot say that one is better than the other. Having execos may not be the most satisfying outcome, but it's better than discarding a method that is as promising 
as a superficial winner. The last topic that I want to briefly talk about is that of digital pathology competitions. I have used many examples from different competitions through this presentation and through the thesis. Competitions have had a very large impact on digital pathology research in the past decade and are very much linked to the shift towards deep learning in image analysis. So we wanted to have a closer look at how they were organized and how they dealt with real-world annotations and evaluation processes. We reviewed digital pathology challenges organized between 2010 and 2022. Based on the publicly available information on those challenges, we focused on which evaluation metrics they used for which task, how they determined what the ground truth was for their evaluation, and how they handled inter-expert disagreements. We also looked at the trends in the top-ranked methods. One of the things we noted was that many challenges use a single expert for their annotations and completely ignore the potential disagreements. Those that use multiple experts typically use an informal consensus method with few explanations on how exactly they came to an agreement and no annotation released beside the agreement. Of the 21 segmentation challenges which we reviewed for this particular aspect, only one, the Gleason 2019 challenge, provided individual annotations from all experts. This is obviously a bit worrying. More worrying are the different mistakes that we found while reviewing the challenges. Now, I want to be clear here that my point is not to say that the challenges where we found those mistakes are bad. The point is that challenges are extremely complicated to organize and that mistakes can easily appear through the whole process. We found problems starting from the constitution of the dataset itself, but we also found problems in annotations, like here with the Gleason 2019 datasets, where in many annotations the contours were not properly closed, leading to large regions of the image where the expert clearly intended to annotate a pattern, but the annotation does not contain any. We also found errors in the evaluation code of another challenge, which had led to incorrect results being published. The main thing that I want to emphasize here is that the reason we found those mistakes is not necessarily that those challenges were particularly badly organized, but rather that these are challenges that were particularly transparent in some aspects of their process, allowing us to better analyze their results. Finding mistakes is part of the scientific process. Making the mistakes hard to find is the problem. This is why our first recommendation from our review of digital pathology challenges is that we need more transparency. Most challenges simply don't publicly release all the information needed to replicate their results and to find potential errors. The second thing that we note is that there is often a tension in the evaluation methods between the competitive goal of the challenge, which is to find a winner, and the scientific goal, which is to learn more about the algorithms and about the objects of the task. The competitive goal may be necessary as an incentive, but it's important to at the very least not limit the evaluation to a metric designed for easy ranking. Finally, we remarked on the importance of keeping pathologists in the loop through the process. From the task definition to the interpretation of the results, the pathologists can make sure that all the work done developing and training these huge models stay focused on things that actually help the pathologist and, at some point, the patients. After this little tour of some of the work done during this thesis, let's take a step back and look at what we learned and where that leads us for the future of AI in digital pathology. First, we have shown the impact of imperfect annotations on the training process of deep learning algorithms. We've also shown that this impact is also present in their evaluation, as imperfections are also part of the test sets. Choosing the right metric or metrics is not easy. The characteristics of each dataset will have an impact on the behavior of the metric, and it's always necessary to take the time to properly analyze the behavior so that the metric is correctly interpreted. Third, experts disagree. That's fine. That's the reality of the medical world. But that means we cannot just assume that there is a truth that it's somewhere in the middle. 
The diversity in expert opinions has to be a part of how we interpret the results of the algorithms. We have studied many digital pathology challenges and it is clear that they, are, that they are an extremely useful resource in the domain. A large part of our current understanding of the state of the art in digital pathology image analysis comes from these challenges. So it's really important to keep working on improving them and making them more reliable, replicable and reusable. One key question for the future is what place can AI at this point take in the pathology workflow? It's clear that we are not ready yet for a fully automated diagnosis from digital pathology images. It's not even certain that it would really be something that we want in the first place. But there is, however, a lot of potential for it to serve for more targeted tasks, like counting objects, measuring areas, or pointing to potential regions or objects of interest always with an expert reviewing the results. Another thing that we can do is use AI in places that are less sensitive because we are not directly working on current patients. For instance, working on retrospective data to try to find new relationships between the images and known patient outcome. These relationships can then be further explored by pathologists to see if there may be some underlying biological explanation and if that can help us better understand the disease. And it's important to keep in mind that, despite all the hype that may exist around AI today, deep learning models are not intelligent entities. They are tools, and for the foreseeable future, they will be tools that are best used by pathologists to make them more efficient, better informed, and to help them take the best decisions with the patients. But modern deep learning methods are certainly no replacement for pathologists or for PhD students. I've tried to ask the DALI image generator to create the slides for this presentation, and I think my version is still a little bit better. Thank you.